stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? <laughs> there it is, right there. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. No public hearings tonight. Uh, there is an adjustment to the agenda. Uh, we're going to hear from Scott, Planning Board, um, and I suggest we add it as item 10.3. Planning Board warrant requests regarding the land use ordinance. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second? Second. All in favor? Thank you. Citizen comments. I'm going to make a citizen comment. Oh, no. Uh -oh. <laughs> You're, we're going to call you Katie. <laughs> Excuse me? <laughs> Alderborough can be difficult sometimes, but it's always wonderful, even when rumors are flying. And I just wanted to nip one in the bud that I have heard recently from some folks. And the rumor is that I'm leaving Walderboro. That is totally not true. And I just want to make sure everybody is aware of that. Um, we're here to stay my wife and I, and we love it here. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Any other citizen comments? Uh, it's Article 7 and 10. Select Board comments. Do you have something, Katie? No. Katie, got something? Clint, <laughs> Captain has Captain. something. Do I? Shellfish update. Oh, the one, the grant we just received? Yeah. Um, I can't remember the name of the grant. Shellfish Resiliency. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. We just got a $6,700 grant from Shellfish Re Resiliency <laughs> um, to enhance our river. Um, the Shellfish Committee is going to put up money matching funds as well with... Um, the shellfish warden and stuff like that work, but we're going to start uh, going with the work that Gabby Hilliard has done by mapping the river in its flow and trying to figure out where to set seed where it potentially could grow much faster. So we get a, another grant this year. Explain how you're going to move the seed, though. That's the exciting part that I don't understand. There's always been a thing where the shellfish harvesters have paid for their time versus doing conservation time. And we've built up quite a stash of money, and I've always wanted to take and pay the harvesters that that uh, did want to do conservation time to go do it and get paid to do it. But if it come out of the shellfish fund, they was considered an employee, so we couldn't do it. So somebody in the legislature gave me the idea, we'll go after a grant, and you can use the matching funds to alleviate that. And that's what we did. So we're going to have roughly thirteen, fourteen thousand dollars to work with to pay guys to actually move seed and try these um, new revolutions of the, the way the river flows to see if it actually does work. And if the theory of Gabby's uh, work uh, mapping the river actually is true and product will grow faster and that's where it will naturally live. So. And we're not paying for seed. And we're not paying for seed, wow. which is very expensive. We'll pay guys to harvest it and transplant it. So you're taking it from areas you can't currently harvest from. Correct. Yep. And you're taking those to areas where you, and growing them in areas where yep. you can harvest. Yep. yep. It's a great plan. Yep. It's almost like aquaculture, but as a town, not as a as an individual entity. Yeah. Yep. So. Thank you. Good deal. Yep. Any other comments from the select board? Town manager. Um, our auditor was here at the last meeting, and... Um, I just wanted to like, update you that we will be meeting um, with the EMS billing that was discussed the last time about EMS billing. We will be meeting with Richard Lash, Mike Poli, and the auditor um, about how to handle those um, billing questions. Um, we did send a letter, it's on the agenda, out to Spectrum about the Chapel Road connectivity. Um, 
AD Gray, we were supposed to have a uh, proposed option, and that will be at the next meeting. I just received it in my email. He got it to you. He got it to me just under the wire, but too wow. late for our meeting. <laughs> um, I also have um, a request that we, we need to deal with. Um, as you know from the auditor visit, we have a lot of issues um, with the initial chart of accounts set up in TRIO. So the auditor um, has given us a cost um, to help us with those um, issues uh, between $1,500 but to no more than $2,000 for two to three days. Um, and, and basically what that is, is is setting up our chart of accounts and giving PEG um, as of December, uh, June 30th, 2017, um, all the good balances and the chart of accounts so everything hits in TRIO. Um, these are people who are done a lot of work in TRIO. So um, if I were to task Peg with that, it would take Peg and I quite a while to do that along with our other duties. So I would recommend that we um, approve that, you approve that. Um, but I just wanted to go over that with you. Um, we are working on the list of invitees for the community forum, um, which we'll be having in April. Um, Maine Water's here tonight. Um, and I just wanted to um, talk a little bit. Um, Liam Ducharm, as many of you know, um, has been um, the voice that you hear when you call the office sometimes, um, has handled our website and everything like that. He has. Um, taken an opportunity to do his startup business full time and will be leaving us April 1st. March 31st, April 1st. March 29th. March, okay, March 29th, exactly. Um, in the meantime, if you see him, just wish him well. And um, we hired um, Tanya Blodgett um, as his replacement. And I just, so if you see her, you might want to welcome her into the family. So it's kind of an exciting time. Anytime you have change, it's always exciting. And just wish Liam well and thank him for all his years of service to the town of Walderboro. And that's it. Do you need a motion on the auditors coming in with those two folks for? It would be nice if we could have discussion later in the meeting or if you want to discuss it now. Yeah. Our reasoning behind it, um, the reason behind it was that Peg and I are um, just inundated, and I think that the chart of accounts is something that we need to get right. Um, we've had the system since 2011, um, and I think it just needs to be, we need it to function the way the auditor would like it to function. I think it's really important and I, it does sound like a lot of money but that's for two people for two to three days worth of work I uh, mean it's going to be about fifty dollars an hour for each person but it is something that um, if, if Peg and I Peg and I could do it but it's going to take a lot longer and then we're not doing the work we need to be doing um, so unfortunately it wasn't something that was done when it was set up so maybe the investment back then to have somebody set it up would have been you want a motion on that now? Economic. So if we authorized $2,000 from the general fund to cover the cost? It can come. I have money in my budget line item. You have item. money in your budget? Yeah. Okay. From your budget? Then. From my budget, yeah. yeah. Right. Yes. I would move that. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Thank you. Consent calendar. Is there a motion? I move approval. Is there a second? I'll second. This was second. our first round with our new approval process yeah. for the warrants. So. Everybody got, got a little confused. Um, so Bob and Jan signed them and gave their approval before anything was done. But all of you, we still want them to appear on the agenda, and we still need all of you to sign them. So it, it, we got off to a little bit of a rough start. It was very hard for all of us to transition. It worked out. We just want to make sure that everybody is on the same page. So we just have to sign all of them. And I, I did have some uh, comments on the minutes, some corrections on the minutes. Yeah, 9.1 really did not cut check, is it? 9.1. Yeah, I agree. Because that just shows you doing something somewhere. Um, it showed two people or... 
the procedure is really to have the two select board members sign off before we pay the items on the warrant. Yeah. That was the, that's what the idea was, right. and if the, the minutes could reflect that, right. that would be correct. Um, it's, we're not signing off. We're not. It's not two of us signing off at select board meetings. We're all signing. Right. We're it's all going to be signing them, but it's two of us signing off before the town actually sends the checks out to pay the bills. Uh, that was one point. Uh, in 8.3, there's a reference to Trio, and it describes Trio as new software, which of course it isn't. We've had Trio here since 2011. What we haven't been doing with Trio, and that's maybe what we could correct the minutes to state, is using it to its full capacity. We've gotten into the habit, in some cases, of following accounts on spreadsheets, which really is an insult to Trio because Trio can handle that and integrate the entries through linkages of accounts to reflect the financial statements accurately. And that's what the two folks from the auditor's company are going to be doing. They're going to be restructuring that chart of accounts and reestablishing the links between those accounts so that when you make an entry, it carries through the way it should using a double entry method. And we have accuracy in our accounting. Um, the only other correction I had concerned 8.1 it was the select board chair who administered the oath of office to Dwight Jones. And with those corrections, if we could have a motion um, to at least approve the minutes and then perhaps to deal with the other items on the consent calendar separately. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Okay, the minutes are corrected. Now the other items, um, there is a motion on the floor and a second. All in favor? Okay, thank you. Main water. Greetings. Greetings. <coughs> so you have a handout in front of you. We uh, do. And the first page that's uh, behind the cover that's labeled current financial is just the same information we gave you last fall, but it's been a while, so we wanted to remind you of our current state and, and where we are. Do you mind going to the No, no I'd be happy. I'd be happy to. Sorry, I got that right. It's only taken me two years for Yeah. Great. Slow learners, I guess. Thank you, Katie. So I'm Rick Knowlton with Maine Water. Uh, and let me start in this handout with the current financial picture that our current utility revenues from the Waldeboro water system aren't adequate to cover the expenses and the, uh, and the needs of the system. So we do need to raise rates, and we have an updated recommendation for you. Um, the second page gives you an update of the five-year forecast that when we met last, that we handed out the um, system improvement plan, the master plan for the system that was completed by Wright Pierce engineers. Uh, and that plan called for uh, about a little less than $100,000 in spending over the next five years. We think we can reduce that amount somewhat. Uh, but the good news was there's no major projects, no, no major investment, no million dollar investments needed in the water system. The water system is actually in very good shape. Um, but we do need to catch up with, with the basic financial status of the system because we have depleted the cash. The last time we were here, if you flip to the next page, the financial recommendation, we actually suggested that you raise rates about $40,000 a year in new revenue, um, and then find a loan mechanism to create some working capital. Um, yeah, upon further reflection and talking a little to Julie about it, what we've done is update the recommendation to say, let's not do the loan piece. Let's just raise rates to a point where um, the water utility stands on its own with no new borrowing. So to do that and to create a financial forecast that, that looks 
reasonable to your auditors, to us, to to others, and gives you the financial stability that the system um, should have um, through the rate revenue, that would increase your overall revenues by about $72,000 from where they are today to a, to a figure of about $300,000 a year to be collected from, uh, from the rate payers in town. Now, that's about a 31 and a half percent increase if you look if you like percentages um, if you like dollars it's about 24 cents a day to the average residential customer uh, but average customer bills which are now a little under seventy dollars would go to about ninety dollars so in a quarter uh, it's it's about twenty dollar increase for each quarter for each three month period um, so that's substantial, and we recognize that. And, and this is a discussion, remember the last time we raised rates was 2005. So it, it's been quite some time. Um, we can still make this effective um, for July 1 if we jump right on it through the process. Um, if we start in April, it does take a good three months to make this happen, um, but we can do that. And as I said, the, the point of, of changing the overall revenue number is to avoid the water system borrowing money in a short-term basis. There's a spreadsheet that gives you projections of, um, of the next several years. I carried it out beyond the five-year period for a number of reasons, but the most important line is the one that's highlighted down in the bottom that shows you the ending cash balance. Um, so you can see right now we're projecting to end 2019 um, in a negative cash balance. So we'll help you through that because we helped you get here. And then we build again. And what's most significant um, is way out in 2028, nine years from now, you see in the principal repayment line, which is right about in the middle of the sheet, and there's a highlighted number at 34,933 out in 2029. What's important and why that's highlighted is look at the year before in 2028 and all the years back through. Right now, the water system has uh, principal repayments every year on your loans of about $100,000 a year. And in 2029, about nine years from now, that drops dramatically because you've paid off a substantial chunk of the borrowing associated with the reconstruction of the system. Um, so from 2029 on, the cash flow opens up, your ability to invest opens up. Uh, and so we've projected at the bottom of this page capital spending that's very minimal between now and then enough to replace your SCADA system, your control system, enough to make improvements to the hydrants, to the service lines, to the meters, the normal stuff. But we haven't included any uh, major spending for main replacements or other projects, A, because we don't know that they're necessary. Um, but as I said the last time too, there are ways for us to finance those if they come up. If MDOT shows up and says we need to do this street, and you need to move the pipe, or um, if working with Mr. Daigle, John says we're going to do this street, so let's fix this one, um, we'll find ways to make those projects happen. Um, because there is funding through the SRF program um, at the state, uh, and there is obviously a capacity for the system to borrow money if it's needed. Um, and those would be project-specific discussions that we could have between now and then. But absent those project-specific discussions, we think we can manage the system forward um, in a conservative fashion and build some cash back. Um, that cash between now and 2029 20, is projected to get up as high as $200,000, um, which if your auditor talks to you about the town finances and cash balances. They say the same thing about the water utility fund, if it looked at it as a fund balance. If you could have six months of cash on hand, that would be good. If you had a year of cash on hand, that would be even better. Um, so somewhere between 
six months and a year's worth of cash would be where it would be nice if the system was there. Um, and the utility rules allow you to build that cash within the water system fund if you'd like to. Um, you can designate it as, as uh, reserve fund for specific uses. You can leave it undesignated. You have some flexibility with, with what you'd want to do with that. So for where we are and looking out in the immediate future, uh, that would be our recommendation for you, and we'd be happy to work with Julie and get that set up and initiate all the paperwork and the filings and the notices and, and make that happen. So that's option one. The next page under that option gives you comparisons, the same comparisons we shared with you last time. Where would Walderboro user rates go for the typical residential consumer versus your neighbors? Um, Great Salt Bay and Maine Water, the Camden Rockland Division. Um, so you can see you're still at the 100 gallon per day use level. You're still the lowest of the neighborhood um, with a 31% increase. So that's, that's the right side of it. Um, but those are the numbers for comparison. You're, you're, you're up with the group, I guess, is the way, one way to look at it. The last page, um, and what you asked me to come back and talk to you about, is the potential for Maine Water Company to purchase the assets of the system and to look at the, the potential for Maine Water to help the town of Walderboro essentially get out of the utility business. Um, and we're happy to do that. We have spent some time on it. I'm sorry it's taken us so long to get back here to talk to you about it. Um, but you have a unique balance sheet because so much of the financing was contributed property. You got great grant funding from rural development um, that created a lot of assets. And so the book value, your net plant, the, the, the value of the assets that you actually reimburse people for is less than what your outstanding debt is. Um, and your outstanding debt today is a little under 1.3 million. It's 1.274 or something, something, something. Um, so that's the amount that, in in our estimation, you got to have at least that much to pay off this debt. And we've looked at the the system from two different perspectives. One is. The Walderboro Water Company being a standalone utility regulated by itself. Um, and if we look at that, honestly, the numbers under Maine Water ownership um, get a little worse instead of better. Um, because with private ownership, we will pay you property taxes, and there are no property taxes in the expense line today paid to the town of Walderboro by the town of Walderboro. We pay income taxes as a private entity. There are no income taxes on the expense side. So our cost of business in Walderboro actually would go up as a standalone entity. So we didn't spend a lot of time showing you that set of numbers because we didn't think you'd be all that interested. Um, all we do in that scenario is get you out of the water business, but together we'd have a set of customers that would not have the lowest rates in the neighborhood, but would have potentially the highest rates in the neighborhood, just to make that transition. So we thought a lot about the concept of integrating Walderboro into our Camden Rockland division, which serves the mid-coast. It's all seven towns from Camden to Thomaston and Owl's Head, but it's inclusive of Union and Warren. And Union and Warren are both served by satellite systems. Um, there's a well stationed and treatment facility in Union. There's a well stationed and treatment facility in Warren. Um, the tank off Route 1 in Warren is connected to the well station in Warren, the same way your tank is connected to your well station. And it's not connected to the Mirror Lake system in any way. The Mirror Lake system comes into South Warren and goes out to the Main State Prison. Um, but doesn't come up Route 1. So Warren and Union systems, there was the Union Water Company, there was the Warren Water Company, those were acquired um, and integrated into 
of the consolidated rates and the consolidated books of what we call the Camden Rockland Water System and the Camden Rockland Division, which Mike Cummins happens to run for. So that's what Mike's here. Um, so if that integration to our operations um, has interest to you, then the numbers get different because we would put Waldboro customers on the same set of rates and integrate the assets under the same set of books that we use for the rest of the system. Um, much the same way CMP works on your electric bill, um, the folks in Waldboro pay the same rates that everybody in the CMP service territory pays. Waldboro customers would be on the same set of rates that our customers in Camden or Thomaston or Rockland or Union or Warren would pay. Um, and collectively, we would make investments in each town in the system as necessary, and that cost of the investment gets shared by everyone. Um, so some people like that theory, that you get to not worry when it's Waldboro's turn to have a major project done, because it's shared by all of the customers on that same rate structure. Um, some people don't like it because that project may be in Rockport next year, and all the customers in Waldboro get to support that particular investment. Over time, we think it works itself out, and it gives you a level of service um, that we hope is consistent, no matter whether you're in Rockport or Camden or Waldboro. And it gives you some protection from the swings and the exposures to major projects and major capital investments. So we happen to like that thought, but it's something that we'd ask you to think about and explore. But under that scenario, the numbers look a little bit different. Um, instead of having your numbers, uh, your, your residential rates would be in the comparison table, that small table, it would be the same rates that are shown for main water CNR. Um, so the structure is a little bit different than your current rate structure, and the impacts on individual users and how much water they use would have to walk you through that sheet because we we would be putting you onto that rate structure. The biggest single change um, for the current rates in Waldeboro, today in Waldeboro the minimum bill includes 75 gallons of water a day. So whether you use 75 gallons a day or not, that's what you pay for in your minimum bill. In the Camden Rockland division, the minimum bills include 25 gallons of water a day. So everything above 25 gallons a day you pay for. Now the rate that you pay in the Camden Rockland system is actually lower per unit than the rates currently in Waldboro. Um, so that's why when you use a little bit more in Camden Rockland, the 1,500 gallons a day, the bill is smaller than it is in Waldboro because in Waldboro once you get beyond 75 gallons a day, the bill climbs higher and faster than it does in the Camden Rockland system. So the structure of the rates is a little bit different. The purpose of the lower amount of water in the minimum bill is to promote conservation and to you pay for what you use. Um, at the rate of 75 gallons a day in the minimum bill, you have about 40% of the customers using less than that. So there's an ar argument for those for a, for a large number of customers in Waldeboro, they're actually paying for water that they don't really use every quarter. Some quarters they may go over, but some quarters they don't. Um, when you set that allowance in the minimum bill lower, uh, some utilities actually have no water included in the allowance, um, then it's a more equitable approach to having each customer pay for exactly what they're using and not paying for water that they don't need. So that difference and that nuance in the way the rates are structured will bring different impacts to different customers in Waldeboro. I'm not talking significant, but a few dollars here and a few dollars there in a quarterly bill. Um, and we have to make you comfortable with that. We'd have to, we really want to show you 
um, those nuances and, and, and give you specific examples of customers and how they would be impacted if you're interested in pursuing this. On the purchase side, if we do this consolidation and integration, we can also pay you more money. Um, the way that the regulatory framework works. Um, we haven't nailed this down because we've got to do some more accounting work and we would need to talk to your accountants at some point, but we're confident that we could pay you more than what your outstanding debt is. Uh, perhaps as much as 1.7 or maybe even 1.8 million, which would pay off your debt and leave you several hundred thousand dollars in the bank for you to do other things with. On top of that, we are still projecting that you would give us a property tax bill for the tank that we now own, for the well station that we would now own, for the pipes that we would now own. And based on your current mill rate and the valuations that we see in other towns, um, that's a fifty to sixty thousand dollar a year income stream to the town that you don't have today. You'd also see some administrative costs drop off. You'd see some audit costs drop off. Um, there'd be some other minor financial benefits to the town. Insurance. Um, <laughs> there may Big be one. Some, there may be some stress <laughs> and some risk management strategies that you'd mm -hmm. want to think about. But if those things are interesting to you, um, we'd be excited to explore it with you. Um, we'd want to know how you'd best want to do that. Um, we've seen some communities hire independent appraisal firms to say this is what the water system's worth and we negotiate from there. Uh, we've seen some communities set up a a subcommittee of the select board um, to work with the utility to come to a negotiation. Uh, however you'd like to proceed, um, if you're interested in that approach, um, we'd be happy to do it. And we'd be happy to work with you. I got one question. <clears throat> so instead of the 31.5% rate increase, we'd probably go up closer to 40%. Well, that would be part of the strategy here is to, um, actually, no, let me let me back up. Some people will see that, yes. But because that's what it shows. In terms of if impact go, to residential customers, what what the 31.5% rate increase does is get you to $300,000 a year overall revenues for the utility. If we put the all the rural customers on the Camden Rockland rate structure. At the end of the math, we end up with about three hundred thousand dollars worth of revenue added to the Camden Rockland division, added to ours. So some people are actually going to pay less <coughs> because it isn't across the board. It's a it's a collection of impacts. Um, the impact to the town of Waldeboro, the public fire protection bill, for example, might be lower under the Camden Rockland rates than it is with a 31.5% increase of your existing rate. And that's math that we need to show you across the customer group. So the starting point, there's no, there's literally no difference in the total revenue that's, that's obtained by using either the Camden Rockland rates or an across the board 31.5% increase to the existing rates. But the distribution of who's paying what does vary. Um, and unfortunately, that's one of the tough parts of this transition, that we can't really negotiate away those winners and losers in that mix. Um, but we can give each one of them a better ability to manage their water bill based on how much water they use. Um, when we talked to you last time, there was concern about the amount of water the system was losing. Yes. It was a lot. Have you... Yeah. Mike's got an yeah, update it's, for you. It's, in, it's improved quite a bit. Okay, and so. and, and from, those, from those leaks that we found a, a few months ago, the, the numbers have risen significantly. All right. And there yep. was also discussion of old pipes being underground, iron pipes that you eventually wanted to deal with that would have required substantial capital investments. I don't, maybe I'm missing it, but I don't see a program for replacing those conduits or pipes in your projection here. 
Have I missed something? No, you haven't. In in the standalone, let's continue the program. Yeah. Um, we haven't included that investment um, because that will, as you can see from your available cash flow, you're going to build up to about a hundred thousand dollars and then grow gradually. There isn't a lot of money there to do that. So, further investment beyond this bare minimum is going to take the 31% and increase it even more because and there's a cost there'll be a cost to that investment in your opinion how does not doing that work <clears throat> affect the valuation sorry affect the valuation of the of the enterprise minimally <clears throat> in, in my view because your system is actually in very good shape for for what it is so much work was done in 2005 and 2006 that the exposure of those those emergency repairs um, we have a great history with it um, and we understand that and the overall investment need um, isn't any different than what we value another system like Waldeboro in fact it's probably less even though that's real and it's there, in comparison to other systems and the way systems would be valued, I'm not sure that you'd see that. Um, I actually, you, you get a, I think you get a check plus for age and condition. If you compare it to a to a real estate sale, this is a good looking house, not a fixer upper. Um, and in our integration model. That's, I think, where the biggest benefit to Waldeboro ratepayers comes in. Because in the Camden Rockland division, in the Midcoast area, um, our average capital investment program runs about $3 million a year. Um, so for us to find $300,000, $400,000, $500,000 to put into Waldeboro in any one year is actually not that difficult for us and there'd be no impact to ratepayers yeah. at all yeah. that investment cost gets shared across the area and across the service territory and all the customers that are connected so we pay very close attention to moving those dollars around to the greatest need to assessing priorities by community by system each year um, and we're making sure that we are making wise investments because they're, it's all assets of ours. And if it's the assets in Waldeboro that are keeping us up at night and creating emergencies and causing expenses that are unnecessary, either through lost water or over time, that's where our capital investment's going to go because that's where the biggest bang for the buck is for us. So that may be in Waldeboro, it may be in Rockland, it may be in Union, but wherever it is, we have three million dollars a year to work with to go after those things um, with no rate impact to to customers so that's that that i think is where the biggest upside is for for waldboro raymond did you have a question if, if the town were to adopt your rate increase to 20 to 2020 and then normalize the increases up to 2029 when your debt service, service falls off and then if you looked at your own estimation, ballpark on the capital improvements for the next 10 years, what would be the free cash flow once we normalize and once the debt service falls off? Well, it goes up by about $70,000 a year. So you look, can look at that as, as additional cash flow. And in the, do you have the, the spread? Right. Um, find the page. Just above the yellow line, you see a net change in cash for the year. So you can see that from 2020 through 2028, that free cash varies from a low of $12,000 a year in 2028 to a high of $34,000 a year in 2020. So free cash each year um, is not high. But it's there, and then, but then you bump up, and you go in 2030 to almost $100,000 a year. 
And now that's more cash flow than you, that's more free cash than you need. And what that really does is open up the opportunity for new borrowing and new debt and you convert that cash into a new loan payment and you can make investment at that point in time. So you have 100 cash, $1,000 free cash, but obviously the point, the system's 10 years older. What would be the increment, do you think, to if we kept it to our own capital expense for the next 10 years? How I'm much saying, capital? Yeah, in the next 10 years, from 2030 to 2040, let's say, as the system ages. $100,000 a year at a municipal borrowing rate would probably let you spend close to $2 million in new investment in that 10-year period. But what would you actually need is what I'm saying. What, what, is this, what will the system need in investment? Oh, well, uh, if, you, if you go back to the capital investment plan um, from Wright Pierce, they identify opportunities to spend several million dollars over the next 25 years. Um, they don't really label it as a need, they label it as a warning that the challenge for water utilities is this cost of infrastructure investment. Um, you have miles and miles and miles of pipe. Some of this pipe dates back to the early 1900s. It's in service today. Um, but when will it no longer meet your service requirements? Um, it's always a wonderful decision of repair or replace. Um, the replacement projects that, that are necessary tend to come when there's a coordination project with either the town or MDOT. The street's going to be dug up or disrupted for storm drainage, for wastewater, for underground power, some other reason. Um, and it's the opportunity to do a replacement for a lower cost per foot so it's, it's a good time to invest in a replacement versus waiting for it to break again and just repair it. So I'm not sure if I really answered your question, but that's a perfect question to, to get into in looking at these options and, and forecasting out where to take them. What kind of shape are the systems in the other towns that you serve in? Are they as good or bad as Waldeboro's, or do you foresee a lot of work? Are we going to be robbing Peter to pay Paul? Well, that's a great question. Uh, I don't believe so. The primary driver of the mid-coast area is the Mirror Lake system. And in 2010, the Mirror Lake system upgraded its treatment program from an unfiltered surface water supply to a filtered surface water supply. And there was a significant rate increase in 2010 following that investment. Um, and so looking forward with Crystal Ball, um, the, the investment in treatment capacity and, and treatment systems, I don't see any major investments in, in the next decade or longer. The rule changes that EPA is proposing are focused on contaminants that are primarily found in groundwaters in Maine. Um, and we haven't looked everywhere yet for perfluorinated compounds, which you may have read about in the, in the news, um, which they found in Pees Air Force <coughs> Plate, the base and old military installations. Uh, those seem to be the, the next 10 years of, of regulatory concern, uh, that along with lead further progress in reducing lead in public water supplies. Um, what we know from the Camden Rockland system is we have no lead service lines, we have no lead pipes that we know of in the system. We know of no lead pipes in the Waldeboro system. Um, so the lead exposure is minimal. The treatment program um, we expect is minimal. Union the little well station there, it serves about 200 customers, um, is not in as good shape as Waldeboro or Warren's is. Um, but it's a system that has excellent quality groundwater, and, and the only treatment that we really do is disinfection. Um, no uranium? So there's no uranium in, in, the, in the groundwater that we're using in Union. Um, so the 
Storage in the systems uh, is in great shape. The primary system in Camden Rockland, uh, we when you go from the the prison in Warren through to Camden, and look at the storage facilities, um, they all have at least 20 years of additional life in them. Um, the Camden tank is is only five years old, um, so that's got. 50 plus years of life left in it. Um, the real issue for the Camden Rockland network is the pipe system, mm -hmm. which is in about the same shape that Walder Burroughs is in. We've got some projects planned um, in the Camden Rockland division. This year in particular, MDO, the city of Rockland is doing a storm water separation uh, project in the, on South Main Street. Uh, so there's a half a mile of pipe to be replaced because of coordination problems uh, on South Main Street in Rockland. That's a project that's probably in the $600,000 range. The town of Rockport is extending sewer down Route 1 um, to connect to the hospital. And we're looking at coordinating with them in that project in extending water down Route 1 as well because there's actually a, a section of Route 1 around Down East Books to the hospital that has no water or sewer service in Route 1. Um, and it never has. So that's always been on the list. Uh, and it sounds like this year may be a year for us to, to work with the town of Rockport to get that done. So there are projects like that. Um, and we'd work with the town of Waldeboro to make sure your projects are on that list too. I'm sorry. <laughs> Who sits on your board? Our board is made up primarily of executive officers from our parent company, Connecticut Water Service. Do you, any of your communities have board representatives? Uh, no, not in Maine. We have one Maine representative on the Connecticut Water Service Board. Our parent company, his name is Brad Hunter. He's a retired banker, uh, lives in Falmouth. Uh, and, and he sits on the board. So he's, he's the main voice to our parent company. So what you're looking for tonight is, should we explore this further? That's kind of like where we're. I think that's your really only decision right now. And, and I don't even know that you're ready to make that decision tonight. I, will, I, will I am. <laughs> you know, I think. <laughs> It's, it's, it's not a decision to be entered lightly. Um, I can tell you from standing here several years ago that the folks that created what is here today um, rejected this option. We offered to buy the system and fix it when it was a mess um, from the prior owner. And the community said, thanks, but this is something we want to do. Private ownership got us to here. We know, we love you guys. We know you can do it, but we want control. We've we done a great job, let me tell you. And, and the, <laughs> I'm sorry, but that was a bad decision. Well, yes and no. I'm. I'm sitting here having to explain a 33 percent increase to yeah. the, to, to, to the to the users of the system. That's not good management by a town. I'm sorry, that's not good management by a town. To 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 not raise rates for that many years, that's not good management. We should not be in the water business. We, we really should not be in the water business. It kind of, that right there alone speaks volumes of what, I, I, and I know you're being gen, very nice and, and, and genuine, but this is not something that the town of Waldeboro should be running. The standard, the most common form of ownership of water systems in Maine is the quasi-municipal water district, where there's a separate group that gets appointed. They have authorities similar to yours, but all they do is manage the water system, um, and it's a and it's a separate entity from the town. Just like in some group, they have the schools separate from the town. Um, same structure. So that's the most common. We happen to be in the neighborhood. We happen to love your town. We happen to be very interested. 
if you were 50 miles away, honestly, we probably wouldn't be uh, because we wouldn't be able to serve you efficiently. We wouldn't be able to offer the integration with our existing systems, uh, and we wouldn't be able to put this together as a package. So honestly, if it was 500 customers you know, away from our existing systems, we probably wouldn't be here. Um, so I'm happy to offer you the opportunity. I will say just one thing about the prior group. They did a hell of a job financing the improvements and obtaining the loans and the grant funding that they did back in 2005. So their interest back then was maximizing those federal and state loan programs. They did a great job. Um, and they got a lot of assets constructed without, without the normal load of debt that you would see a municipality incur. So kudos to them for that. But. I don't disagree with, with where we I'm are. sorry, but it just this is you know this when this first came out a few months ago. I mean, I had 25 phone calls. Like, what happened? And it's, I mean, yeah. it's water should not be our business, in my opinion. Let me clarify. Well, in my be. opinion, <laughs> it doesn't need to be. Right. We can offer you an alternative to that. Could you give us a list of the private properties that you're wanting to include into this purchase? The list of the properties. Because there's, there's more than just those couple that you've listed that the town owns that's been part of the water company. Oh, yeah. The, the assets of the water company that you would be selling, they're the land and well station um, off Cross Street, mm -hmm. the land and tank uh, off Friendship Street, and all the connecting pipes uh, and meters and parts and pieces that make those two things provide service. Because there's other, other pieces of property and we've discussed well, we this. Well, we'd have to negotiate all yeah, that. Yeah, and you know, if the town still has title to the quarry land, we're not interested. If the, title still has, if the town still has title to some of the properties that came a Friendship Street with the original acquisition, we're not interested. If it's not part of the assets and the property necessary to provide utility service, we don't need to buy it. We can if you want us to, but we'd then probably dispose of it because all we would be interested in is providing water service. So what you're looking for the select board to do tonight is to give you some guidance of whether we should explore that option further. The option of... I think there are two things. Okay. One, would you like us to proceed with the rate increase regardless? Because I can assure you that if we pursue the sale option, that takes some time. Um, we can't actually buy the system without approval from the Public Utilities Commission, for example. We could agree, mm -hmm. but they might not. So there's a process for us to go through. So we're going to do the rate increase regardless. Mm -hmm. I think that's wise. So decision number one do we is have to do it all the initiate once? the rate increase. We can amend it along the way as wherever this takes us. But getting it started, getting the clock started, I think would be of great value to the Because I thought about this after our meeting yesterday is that's a big jump. Yep. Fifteen percent. Hmm? Fifteen point three percent the first year. Oh. Second year is thirteen point three. Yeah, it's a it's a jump. Yeah. Yeah, and and we can manage that, but you should. So you're stay only where jumping the well, first year by. What are you saying, Bob? So it's not 15. a thirty-three percent increase well, in it, the first it, year. You won't see the revenues in, in, in again. The, looking at the municipal year, the fiscal year July one. If we had rates effective July one, and they carry through June thirtieth. Yeah, you'd see the full 30%. Okay. This is organized in a calendar year, so right. it's That's off. That's what I was, my question yeah. was. So yeah, I'm sorry it's a third. It, it is a 30% at it one is. time. At it the is. end of this it's year, you're running cash negative if you don't increase the rates. Exactly. Sorry, but even if you do increase the rates, you're still cash negative. We're still going to struggle this year because of the spending on the SCADA system. It's yep. only because of that investment in the SCADA system. So. We'll look for ways to fund that for you or ways to push that into next year. So we have some, the only reason there's negative is because of the capital investment shown below. 
and to the extent we can manage that capital, we can manage the cash. So I think, but maybe I asked you this before, the process right now, we're staying where we are because we don't have time right now to do other things. Do, you was telling about a public hearing? Is this yep, the, the, the rate increase process. Yeah, that's what um, I want to know. Yeah. Yep, what we do is we build together a package that gets sent to the Public Utilities Commission with a notice that we're starting the process, and then we also notice customers in town. And we set a date for a public hearing. We come to this room, we answer all questions, we explain the need for the rate increase, how it's going to affect people, what it is exactly, and we spend as much time with the customers as they want. And then following that uh, public hearing, we yeah. agree that we're going to stay the course or we're going to tweak it based on what we heard at the public hearing, and we take a final package to the Public Utilities Commission, give them the feedback from the public hearing, and ask them to approve it. And at the same time, we've told all of the customers in Waldoboro that if you didn't like what you heard at the public hearing, or if you want the Public Utilities Commission to do a full investigation of this proposal, you may petition the Public Utilities Commission to do so. And if 10% or more of the customers in Waldoboro file a petition asking the Commission to do a full investigation, then the local process stops at that point, it becomes a state process, and instead of having rates effective 30 days after the public hearing, we're going to start a three or four or five month process with the Public Utilities Commission so that they review every line and every dollar and, and, and ask their questions of why is this needed and what's going on in Waldoboro. And the Public Advocate's Office would get involved, and we do what we consider to be the normal rate filing, because that's the way our systems always work. So do the voters have anything going on in the process? Do they vote on this? They no. don't vote, no. but they come to the public hearing, yeah, okay. and then they decide, following the public hearing, okay. whether it makes sense to them or it doesn't. And if it doesn't make sense, then they petition. Go through that. They, yeah. they vote by saying to the Public right. Utilities Commission, please look into this. So and this and I think you already answered it, but the 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 increase, whatever it is, is just by rate payers. That's pay. correct. Mm -hmm. And one of the rate payers is the town. And yeah. It, and it will buyer, impact uh, your yeah. PD to what uh, five thousand. Yeah. Okay. So you're talking a thirty. You're the, big, you're the biggest customer. You're twenty four yeah. to thirty thirty one thirty two thousand dollar increase in our water bill for the town. Right. Again. <laughs> we shouldn't be in the water business. <laughs> so step one would be encouraging us to pull the package together and get the process started for increasing rates, because under either scenario, that's inevitable. That's what's needed. But if we sell and it currently, with that, we need to we, we start the investigation. We don't have to wait. We can go. But then there'll be a second increase if you buy it. No. That's where it gets interesting because if we get those standalone rate increase approved at revenue requirements of three hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars, that's all the revenue we would ever expect to get from Waldoboro customers under the Camden Rockland rates. So that at that point, there's no rate increase, but we have this dynamic of rate design and who's paying what piece of that because of the difference in the rate structures. It's kind of like when you reevaluate property. Exactly. Kind of. Kind of. But when kind you're of. talking about the $300,000 surplus at some point, the cash generation, you're talking about a 28.6% increase overall. Correct. Timing wise is something we talk about, but that's what you're looking at. Exactly. Yep. I, I would entertain a motion to start the process and to. Uh, request a PUC review of the increase in the rates. And I would also entertain a motion to sit down and talk to these folks about buying the utility. If there isn't one, we'll take a second step. But that's, that's what I would entertain a motion to do. So moved. Uh, 
a second. We need to discuss it. Mm -hmm. My feeling is we're delaying the inevitable. Whether we sell it or not, there is going to be an increase in our water rates. And we can blame ourselves for that. It's been our own inaction for the last 13 years. We've done nothing about it. Um, it's not all our fault. I think we can cast some of the blame in your direction. Yes, you can. <coughs> but the facts we are the facts. We should have screamed earlier. You, you can't operate with negative cash. It just doesn't work. Can we spread it out, the increase over a number of, a couple, at least a, a couple years or three years? Or is that not an option? No, it, it, it is an option. Again, the, it, working through this projection, um, it's not the operations, the hour-to-hour, day-to-day operations. It's mm -hmm. what do we need to fix? Mm -hmm. What do we need to replace that drives the negative cash potential? We can run the system hour-to-hour, day-to-day, pay the basic bills, the power, the chemicals, our labor, and you are fine where you are. What you have no money to do is, is replace meters, fix broken pipes, change out hydrants that get hit by the snow plow. You know, all of those things that aren't normal part of the day, you have no money for. And at some point, not doing it is going to get people very unhappy. Yes. Is a 10 or 11 percent increase over the next three years feasible, or is it still not? Is is that gonna? It'll still get you to the same point, but do we? As In, Bob said, we helped you get right, here, right. and we can help you get out of it. Yeah. So yeah, this can be structured yeah. in a way that ramps this mm -hmm. instead of hits a wall and steps up. Um, as long as we're in agreement that that's the way you want to do this, we can create, we can create a different financial picture. Um, the SCADA system is a significant investment plan for this year because you're running on a Windows XP platform that you. I don't think you have a choice with that. But maybe we can finance that for you and get paid next year. Or, okay. No, we can figure that piece out. Mm -hmm. uh, just a 31.5% increase. I know. It's just a lot of a pill to swallow. Yeah, you know, the motion isn't on the degree of increase. Right, the I understand is on, that. You know, but I'm just, in the I'm just in the discussion of, I get it. of yeah. what we can potentially do. Yep. But yeah, we'd love guidance from mm -hmm. you on what you think is um, an acceptable time, recognizing where we want to get to. Can we do it in three years? Can we do it in two years? Your mm -hmm. guidance on that would help <coughs> tremendously. Because the I don't have an issue. I don't have an issue with the with the rate increase at all. I mean, it's when Jill and I or I brought up some issues with water. You did. It wasn't yeah, me. <laughs> and she pursued it for me because I didn't know where to go with it. Um, is nothing's been done for going on fourteen years. Yeah. Nothing. And that drives me crazy that nobody even paid attention to it. So, but to still to turn around and hit the ratepayers with a 31.5% increase is just brutal. So, if it could be, at least they know it would be coming in small increments, but they know, they'll get to the same, same place. Maybe what we should do is set up a subcommittee of the select board to, to work with you to structure that. That'd be great. That way. Yep. I don't think it would take. Many hours. I don't okay. think you've got or the basic meeting. material right here. Yeah, right. and this is all easily moved around yep. and shuffled, and, mm -hmm. and we can give you a snapshot of what what you like to try and make work. Yep. Pretty easily. Yep. And you volunteers for that. Okay. So I I think it's time to move the question on the motion, and then talk about how to structure our approach to this with you folks, maybe with the subcommittee. So I is. Are we ready to vote? All in favor? Okay. Now let's talk for a minute about how we're going to structure this conversation with our with our water manager. Um, I think the idea of a subcommittee is a good one. And if we think we need help, uh, if we think the subcommittee needs help, we can we can get it. 
look, I'm guessing in terms of the rate increase, sitting down with you folks and massaging these numbers a bit should get us to where we feel we're comfortable and we're not hammering people over the head too much at, all at once. Correct. Okay. I, I would agree with that. And, and the guidance that the subcommittee may want would be some advice from the town's attorney and some advice from the town's auditor because I can assure you that your auditor may have seen this. He mentioned he, it when he was here. He's, he's lectured us. He lectured us. There you go. Yeah. Those are great places to start. Okay. Who, who would like to be on the subcommittee? I'd like to. I started this, so I might as well finish it. Might as well finish it. <laughs> How about you, Bob? I, I'd be happy to do it now that I'm okay. not as busy as I was. So is that okay with everybody that Clint, yeah. uh, Clint, Clint. Abner and I, <laughs> sorry, that Abner and I work with Julie and the water folks? I wrote Clint too. Bob. Can't get away from it, Clint. Okay. Thank I you. Really I think we're set. Ron. It's always educational when you guys come down here and talk to us. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And just because he probably doesn't hear it enough, he, Mr. Cummins is excellent, <laughs> wonderful. Great job. Thank you, Julie. He does. He really, I, I mean, honestly, like when I call, he answers his phone, which is great. So I just wanted to give you a kudos in public, on TV. Thank you. There we go. <laughs> Thank you, Julie. We have the president no Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Mike Thomas. Next item on the agenda is the invitation to list for the community forum. Um, we're progressing with that. We're getting more um, suggestions from different people as I send out them to send out to look at the list. Um, so if anybody has any from the select board, you just have to let me know. Could you apprise us one more time okay. what this is all about? So we're going to have important and whom we'd like to be on it. Okay, well, <laughs> it's by invitation only, so let's get that out there first. Um, what we're doing is we're going to have a community forum on April 24th, and it's to discuss what the needs are in the community of Waldeboro. So these are the needs that potentially are related to food security, to poverty, to drugs, to... Um, what are the services that this community needs? What do services do we already provide? What services do we need to be successful? And all of this is a culmination of um, several entities. One would be the town of Walderboro. The other would be Maine Health, um, which is technically Lincoln Health, um, and Penn Bay, and the YMCA. So before everybody jumps out of their seat because they heard the YMCA, I'm just going to address the elephant in the room. <laughs> um, they do provide um, a lot of good services. Um, I don't think anybody's thinking we're going to build a pool in Waldeboro, um, but there is a lot of services that they provide for children, for seniors, that is lacking in Waldeboro. So there's a managed way to do this and we have to have a holistic approach and I'm going to get on my soapbox now, and you can. Um, we have issues in Waldeboro. We have poverty. We have drugs. We have, and and that's that's not a, that's not a blue collar addiction either. That that goes all over. For us to be successful, we have to address those things. Um, it affects our economics, our ability to grow, and our ability to thrive what we provide and how we provide it with partners that we could find grant funding for and build things together, that's what's important. But we have to know what we need. What do we need? So we're looking for, um, we're looking to invite entities and individuals that can provide a lot of insight into the needs of Waldeboro and also into um, what what do we really need to affect change and, and that's what it comes down to is affecting change Th to me this is like the most important thing that we can do in Waldeboro um, I, I think that 
we are never ever going to thrive unless we address the issues that we have. Whether they're real issues or perceived issues, we have to address them. And um, talking about them is the first step, I think. I feel like I'm like this, you know, addiction coach or something here. But um, so that's what we're doing. So we're coming up with um, a list, um, and it's going to be a roundtable um, discussion about five to six to a group, and ask about four important questions of this group and um, these groups, and then come up with a plan from there. So it's just the first step in a long line of things that has to occur. So that's where we're at. But we're building our list. Um, and like I said, it's not, this isn't about building a rec center. <laughs> it's about what we're actually trying to accomplish, which is, is change in our community. What sparked me on this whole thing was the first time we met at the Y with Lincoln Health, the Y, some other folks who have done similar things in other towns. And the Y asked somebody to come in to do the same kind of thing for them. They were going to build a swimming pool. And they had their forum. And a lot of people came and they realized nobody wanted that stupid swimming pool. And so they've done something entirely different with their organization that Julie's described just now. Our hope is that we'll gather enough people in this leadership forum to talk about the real needs of the community so that we can structure around the needs and figure out what it is we have to have. That's, that's the hope. Marcia. I think this is an excellent idea. Very beneficial for world. And you just don't know what you don't know. That's right. You really don't. And it's I will tell you, it, it's it's one of those things where from this discussion I got in touch with the um, BRCRC from Booth Bay Region and it's it's how they approached their community needs. They have a community navigator, so if somebody has something and it doesn't matter what age or, or walk of life you are, you come in if you have an issue. Um, God bless Daryl, because Daryl does it here. Um, you know, somebody comes in and needs something. Um, if they need, if they have heat requirements, okay, so how's your food security? How's this? How's that? Where do you get the help? We don't, we don't know that. I, I'm not trained in that. I, I wouldn't know. And Daryl does his very level best, but they have a navigator, and it, it's all supported with donations through... Um, the community you know this is just we're a part of it but this is something that the community itself is going to have to take and foster um, but it, it's something that's very important and I just I don't know I get all excited about it it's a good thing so um, we will be doing that so you some of you may be getting an invitation and if you have suggestions please let me know and it's not if you're not invited it doesn't mean you're not valued it just mm -hmm. means that there's a very specific reasoning for the people that are going to be there and then we're going to do afterwards we're going to follow up and share all this wonderful information in public forums and things like that uh, 9.3 chapel road connectivity i just wanted to update you that we sent um, based on a letter that was crafted handily by the ctc the select board um, and myself, we sent off a letter to Chapel to um, Spectrum requesting clarification on why they haven't started on Chapel Road yet. And I sent that to everybody I could find. So from the local um, representative on up the food chain. Okay. The CEO Good. got an email from Good. me. We'll see if he listens. I'm Robin Philbert from Chapel Road and have been working with the different residences to try to help support the information that you all need to get this moving. And after you've sent that letter, how long would you anticipate or would you wait until you received any feedback before you might take a next step? Hopefully that won't happen, well, but... Well, they have technically quite a while left to 
do what they're going to do or not do. So I can't, I mean, I can send letters every week or emails every week, but they have nine months from November 21st, I think it is, to, to do something. So, so they have six, about six more months mm -hmm. they would really need to, to actually do something or even I'm going to have to wait for that to even say they're not doing anything. I can't even take the next step to enforce that in the, um, the agreement, agreement, in the franchise agreement until sadly that time has elapsed. It's, it's not a great system. I'll be honest with you. It's, it's not, but referring back and I think you know this but referring to some of the comments you made earlier about this community information gathering of you know different things that we need in Waldoboro to make us successful um, along with the poverty and the, the drug and food insecurity this is a really big issue and I realize that a majority of the town has that connectivity and ability for that but we on Chapel Road have been dropped based on that um, lack of commitment to the um, franchise agreement and I'm a professional I work at Penn Bay I work in um, cardiac rehab I have to keep up my skills we're talking about employability you know income and all that and it's really been a burden for me to keep up my CEUs um, because of the lack of options that we have out in our area and the one that we did have through Red Zone a year ago this spring we lost because they decommissioned the tower up on um, Clary Hill and they relocated it over to Mount Pleasant and now we are outside the perimeter of what we can receive from that source. So we're really in a, between a rock and a hard place and that's just our residence and we live in a fairly open part of that road. And I think I brought 16 or 17 names of other individuals that are in a less um, conducive situation to get satellite or whatnot and there are a couple of businesses out there and home businesses and people that moved in to Chapel Road under the impression that they would be able to have connectivity and they don't and we're young people with families and jobs and it's it's really a hardship and I'm, I'm hoping that just because it's a small numbered situation that we'd like to be kind of have that same opportunity that the rest of the town because we are um, contributors to the town too and it would be very helpful to our livelihood. So I appreciate the work that's been done by your committee and the recent letter that you've sent. Mm -hmm. It's just moving, it's it's moving a corporation and I, I, like I said, you know, and it's been a frustrating process, we'll say that. <laughs> It hasn't yes. been pleasant. But when you're the one, you know, on the side living it and waiting to, you know, and I realize there's a place down here that we can access a computer, but that's not really feasible. Not and you've worked yeah, all it's not the long same. to yeah. come down and sit and do two, you know, two hours of a webinar or try to, you know, get on a course. It's really not working. So I really hope that this goes through. Yeah, like I said, unfortunately, they may wait. I, 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 other than sending letters, my only recourse is once that timeline passes, then we'll have recourse under the franchise agreement. Until then, I don't know what more to do, to be honest with you. Thank you for your comments. They're very helpful. Uh, new business, 10.1, Madamic Watershed. I would say, given the lateness of the hour, we should just skip to, uh, to we Scott. still have Max and Scott. Okay. Let's do Scott first. Okay. <laughs> Max, you Would just you got demoted. Go to <laughs> <laughs> no, I'd be happy to give up my time for now. I'll just, I'll go ahead. Um, So this is regarding the modifications to the land use ordinance. 
Um, for those of you who weren't here last, I think it was August we were here before, um, there have been a number of revisions to the state guidelines for their land use ordinances since Waldeboro has revised ours. Mm -hmm. And we need to bring our, uh, our ordinances into to, to match the states, to be compatible with the states. We're allowed to have tighter restrictions, but not looser restrictions. And this is primarily related to Article 7, which is the shoreland zoning, and Article 10, which is non-conforming uses, which is um, uh, properties and structures that are grandfathered because they never, they, you know, a land use ordinance change was made, but the house existed near the water, for example. So that's what Chapter 10 is about, non-conforming properties and structures. So uh, the planning board made a large series of modifications to be in conformance with the state. A lot of them, we did a lot of uh, edits to try to make the ordinance a little clearer, because it's terrible language in general. Marshall knows went through part of this process with us. Um, so. Uh, we brought that, we made all those changes, there were a number of things, um, and there's a summary sheet that, w that I made since our last discussion that we will use for the pu uh, public hearing if the, if the select board approves. We go to a public hearing, um, which would be tomorrow night, and hopefully, because then we could put it on the June ballot so that we could approve the changes, because it's been a while since the state made theirs. Um, so I'd be, if anybody has specific questions, I'd be happy to go through all these details, but um, tomorrow night's available if you're interested in the changes to those two um, ordinances. Um, so we have a summary of those, and tomorrow night we'll have copies so everybody can see all the changes. Um, then there were a lot of um, details of making sure that the references to other sections were made. Um, the, I think the two major, two major things to point out in the non-conforming uses um, and in the, the uh, shoreland zoning, one of the biggest things is timber harvesting in the shoreland zone, because Waldeboro has decided to let the state uh, take care of monitoring that, so the whole bunch has come out. So we've actually been a lot with that, and so part of it is actually less complicated than it was. Um, the reason why I'm back here today, since we talked about it last August, was that um, the state had changed the setback for grazing and tilling and manure storage um, from 75 feet to 100 over the intervening years. And the board came to the, to the select board, the planning board, had decided that we would accept that 100 foot setback. Um, there was some, there had been a lot of discussion among the planning board and then there was another discussion here at the select board that maybe we should go stricter than the state and have a larger setback from the water for manure storage specifically. Um, so the select board tasked the planning board to go back and look at this in more detail. Um, and so we did. Um, and I have a I have a summary sheet which for, for you folks and um, for the folks here in the audience, I'll try to make a quick summary of, of what we did. Um, and we did a lot of communicating with the state on this, and some of it was by phone and some of it with, was by email. And I'm not going to differentiate here between those two, but we, we talked to the agricultural compliance supervisor for the state of Maine. And so he's responsible for uh, dealing with um, any issues relative to agriculture that might cause issues in the, for, in the water. Um, so they're responsible for, they were the group responsible for setting the setbacks for manure and, and grazing and tilling. Um, and uh, he urged us actually not to change the setback from 100 feet. Um, he's the guy that does, goes in and does the problem solving and negotiates with the farms or whatever if there's any issues. Um, uh, because he believes that their 100-foot setback that they increased to is very conservative and based on lots of soil types and lots of types of drainage and, and ground slopes. 
and so he suggested that um, that it would be a good idea. He would prefer that we not, and he also said that the state would have to look at change if we made the setback more restrictive. That we'd have to consider the Right to Farm Act, which exists in Maine to protect the farmers. That we'd be putting, he didn't want to put too much restrictions on them. Um, we then talked to um, at the State Agriculture Department again. He's a fellow. He's the Nutrient Management Director of the Soil Division, and um, he was a useful resource because uh, the nutrient management plans. That's what the farms have to file. If the large farms have to file for that so that they're managing all their manure and anything else that they're putting on their on their farmland. Um, and uh, he said that those big farms, that's going to, should give us, ensure us, ensure protection of the river for large scale operations. And he was also interested in avoiding a negative factor, uh, impact of small farmers. Um, and he suggested that if we were going to recommend that we would change the setback, we'd have to come with, uh, we'd have to argue for that change to the state to allow us to make a more restrictive uh, um, setback, that we'd have to account for different soil, the specific soil slope, drainage, and farm sizes to give the state some factual basis for recommending a larger setback for Walderboro. Um, we talked to the program supervisor for the West Growing Area of Maine. So we decided not just talking to the Agriculture Department, we talked to the Department of Marine Resources. And I guess we're in the West, Abden would know this, we're in the West section. And um, so the, uh, he, he said that they monitor the shore um, and report any areas of concern. What I found, what we found interesting was that if they see something of concern, they actually flag it to the Department of Agriculture and have the Department of Agriculture look into it um, to make an assessment of the health risk. So the Agriculture Department does the health risk assessment for anything that might impact the, the waterway, which I found, I think we found interesting. Um, so um, also, uh, Max contacted some, uh, uh, got a contact at Orono that there's a project run by a couple of professors, one at the University of New Hampshire, one at the University of Maine. They've been looking at, I, I guess, they're doing analysis of the, of the water testing to determine the source of the, of the failed, source of the bacteria, and they have not found any livestock-related bacteria in any of the poor results in the Madomic, which, um, so they don't attribute that to any of the any farm or manure, uh, you know, standard manure. That doesn't, that leaves apart bird manure and dog manure and all that other sort of stuff. Just, but there's no livestock related issues. Um, so that was, you know, we had a lot of discussion about, about uh, these various contacts and sort of the summary is that um, this is, this setback is considered conservative by the state, and it's basically the the marine guy referred us back to the same contact that Julie had recommended at the Department of Agriculture where we started. So, um, so um, that's not to say all of us were satisfied, but the majority of us were satisfied that the hundred foot setback makes sense. We voted four to one to keep to come back to the select board with the same recommendation that we were here last August, not to change it. The, the dissenting, vote, dissenting voter felt that with global warming and more high rain events that there's a potential for a problem and that rather than wait for a bad result, we should increase the number now. The, the four yes votes that we should come back with the same setback felt that we should stick with the state guidelines that they're supporting um, and um, that we're not in a position to be able to provide concrete justification for changing the setback. We just don't have the technical uh, firepower to try to do that. Um, so we do strongly recommend and have discussed it in our board of ways that we can Increased public awareness of the water of the water quality importance to the town. I think most people are aware of it, but relative to what people are doing by the shore and within 
within hailing distance of the water, um, the more knowledge that there is about what the, rest the restrictions that do exist in the, in the land use ordinance, the, the better off and safer the waterway is going to be. So um, that's our summary. Cool. Thank you very much. Excellent. Any, any questions? Now, what do you need from us tonight? Um, if, if you approve this, we can have a public discussion tomorrow night and um, it's already been announced that it's that it's on our agenda for tomorrow, um, and then that would allow us, if uh, after the public Point meeting, it would well, give us the potential to put it on the June ballot. So we want a reference in our motion to Section 10 non-conforming uses chain amendments thereto by your as presented to the select board. Yeah, and so, and Section 7. And sorry, Article 7 section and Article seven. 10. All right, Section 7 as well. I move that. Is there a second? Second. Is there any further discussion? All in favor? You've done a lot of work on this. Thank you. Thank All you. the board did. It was. It was. Uh, we, we spent a lot of hours talking about it too. Well, it was important. I mean, it was. A, yeah, I'm glad we did it. It was really a good thing to take the time. Just a reassurance. That's yeah. All. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and then I mean, we also have. You know, we've got to make them back it up if we do have an issue. Yep. We got to make sure. You know, the the state's responsible to help us. So. Yep. Great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you, Scott. Where's our Mad Max? Mad Max is in the back. <laughs> I know. Mad Max. He's amazing. <laughs> All good? Yep. I think yep. you know why I'm here. The only reason I ever come here, apparently, now. <laughs> <laughs> you sell it? <laughs> you only want it for one thing. <laughs> <laughs> so medical marijuana. Uh, ever since speak last, up. I speak up a little bit. So medical marijuana. Last time I was here, uh, the discussion was about removing the dispensary language from the land use ordinance. Since then, I know that there has been some comments from a range of people talking about caregivers. So uh, last week, I created a draft for a Waldeboro Medical Marijuana Ordinance, which takes language from the state. And the goal is to put in regulations for the growing of medical marijuana for registered caregivers, which is something that the state does allow. And we're sort of going into unknown territory in this section. So the moratorium. The moratorium. First of all, can we just before no, we forget? I think we need to talk about the moratorium more importantly than the. Okay. Right. So yeah. so the moratorium, we need to set a date to vote on. Mm -hmm. We do. For an open town meeting. Okay. Because we have to do that because that puts us in a good place that nothing can be done. For a dispensary. For any. For dispensaries only. For dispensaries it's only. only. Dispensary. Yeah. Okay. I thought we had a moratorium already. The vote was more for the language on the moratorium that the town would have to vote on. So a town meeting will need to be held, and the town will have to vote for that moratorium. No. No. I'm going to ask a question. Mm -hmm. My impression is the moratorium is simply something the select board has within their power to do for six months at a time, which done before, which doesn't, re moratorium is not an ordinance. But we need to vote on that. But you did already. No, they need to have a public vote on that. According to our clerk, yes. it has to be a public vote. Didn't, now, hold on. That's, you a, presented, that's a change. This is, this is a change. You presented this moratorium language, which was excellently done, and which looked to have incredible legal backing, and you had a vote which was 311. From, right, but. And, and it only addressed dispensaries. Right. Cultivation for dispensaries. But the clerk yes. came to Max and told him that that needs to, just like we did the moratorium, remember when we were down at the school, Miller so School? You're, so you're saying that, you know, you did, okay, I understand what you're saying. You're saying it's the same rules. It's the same rules. We have to have a public meeting and a public vote on it. Like we did a year ago. Like we did a year ago. That is what, that is what Eileen has said, and I, I, I think she's right. 
about so, that. So you're saying this more will be not the Torian has to be on the June ballot? No. I'm not saying we have to have a town special meeting. town meeting so that it's protected until the moratorium, until a vote in June. And we can have it in this room. And you can have it in here. Where would you have the town meeting? I would say at the next select board meeting. So, so right now, the, Got it. so right now the January twenty second approval that select board gave for the moratorium for the moratorium is not valid. Well, no, they approved it, but they needed to set a date then to have a public meeting, which we didn't realize. I guess no, we. My understanding was understand. that we were allowed to approve it. And so it's the same that. process we had. It's a the year same ago process January. from a year ago. We have to follow. Now the date can still be held January 22nd. So even if we approved it in the next select board meeting or two or two meetings from now, we would still that date would still be valid. Okay. That's and, what then, and then what you're saying is, if we put the elimination of section D on the ballot in June. Yep. And if the voters approve it, then in effect the moratorium's purpose has been served and it becomes yes. It ceases, it becomes moot right. because yep. this takes its place. Correct. Yep. Got it. The, but Max wanted the moratorium to protect the town from then I understood. till June. It's just Yep. Process. Process. Yep. Process. So we want to set a date for the public. Right. I just wanted to get that set and done so that we know. And Daryl, you're going to be our moderator, right? Daryl? Yeah. <laughs> Don't sound so enthused, Daryl. <laughs> so that would be March 26th for the open town meeting mm -hmm. on the mar marijuana moratorium. And we would hold that meeting in this room at 6 o'clock on the 26th of March. Mm -hmm. Is everybody okay with that? Do I have a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. <laughs> Any okay. further discussion? Yes. I want to know exactly what this is going to entail. What the moratorium is going to be about? What is this uh, public hearing going to uh, question? It's not a public hearing. It's an open town meeting. Open town meeting. Yep. What is it going to question? What will be on the warrant of that meeting is whether or not to approve the moratorium that the select board blessed in its January meeting. Can I ask if have we ever had a document about what he blessed? Yes. Yes. We do have a document? Yeah. Should be on the website. It's this. Don't we, don't we have it on the website? It would be in the meeting packet on the website. Okay. So what what will so the wording this, be? This is just waiting. Okay. Never seen it. Let's see if I can pull it up. You got it, and you voted on it in January. Isn't this the mm -hmm. one? The moratorium. Yeah. That's what I thought. We'll see. You don't have that. No, you don't. Can I see? Oh. Um, okay. No, I don't have this. I well, you know. did back in January because you voted on it. <laughs> well, I don't have this piece of paper. Well, she might have been the one against it. Yeah, you probably wouldn't have got one. <laughs> I think she was the one against it. <laughs> yeah, no, she Bob didn't, didn't go for it. <laughs> yep. The table there. Yep. I, I, I think he abstained. Yeah. He abstained. She didn't vote for it. It was us that voted for it. Oh. Sure. Remember, don't you, Jan? Oh. I do. I do. No? No, I remember voting for it. I remember me voting for it. Yeah. What's, what's the yeah. formal procedure to get the elimination of Section D on the June 12th ballot? Mm. <laughs> I sent the revised language to the select board, which is taking the language I assume is in your hand, hence just striking the language from it. That right. question would be put on the June ballot. So what's the process to get it on the ballot? Public hearing. And well, I think you're going to have the you're going to have the town meeting to see if they're even going to go along right. with the moratorium. That's right. If they don't, then you don't have to worry about the rest of it. Yep. So the town meeting will vote on this too, as to put on the ballot. 
Um, no. Be on the warrant for the special town meeting. Yes. The moratorium will be on the warrant. And this and this deletion would be. No. No. That that's a totally that separate thing. That's, that's a totally yeah, separate that thing. That will not be on the warrant. That will be on the June. Warrant. The June warrant. I'm asking how how is this going to. They have to approve it. So so they, they would approve to put it on the ballot the next. Right. Week. Got it. Okay. Sorry, I was confused. So was I. I'm sorry, Max. I didn't mean, I just wanted oh, no. to get that resolved. What have you done now? It's fine. What have I done now? No, nothing. nothing. We love Max. So, medical marijuana ordinance. So sorry, we haven't we haven't voted yet. No. Right. We haven't voted yet. So we we are still in discussion of this putting this on uh, the board special, of special town meeting yeah. scheduled for the two weeks from today, right? March 26th, 26th at March. six o'clock. Yeah. I would just confirm that date is fine with Eileen. Just, I'm saying, well, oh, yeah. we will need to confirm that to make sure that that's a fine, that's a proper date. All right. Subject to Eileen's confirmation. Just meeting the seven day criteria. Yeah. yeah. Any further discussion on this one? All in favor? Okay. The moratorium is taken care of. And I would I would suggest that we pend any discussion of an ordinance on medical marijuana and caregivers until at least the next meeting, if not the, the meeting following that, in order for people to digest just exactly what it is that's been put together and how we want to proceed with it. Okay. Is that all right with you, Matt? If that's how you'd like to proceed, then all right. I don't, let me hear from the rest of the board. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did great. you have anything to hand out to them? Um, other than the copy that I sent out to everyone last Friday, I believe. You're assuming everyone's got emails and printers. Assuming that. Um, but I do have physical copies, because uh, there was very minor changes that I made, um, just either grammatical or um, stuff after speaking with the main, the main municipal association, just hearing some advice from them. There's sometimes very minor changes, so if you'd like a copy of that, then I can. I would uh, send it back out. Send it, send it back, back out via email. Thank you. Sorry, Marcia. Can I just make a recommendation since um, I couldn't find this, okay? So I think that other people may have a hard time finding it, so. Um, I'll have Liam put it on the if you could. web better. I think it was in the meeting packet, probably, but not. But you'd have to know where to go on the website. Yeah, right? the date of the select board meeting at which this was considered in under documents under okay. the documents okay. link. Okay. And it's not, you're right. It's not easy to find. Frank, did you? I just had a couple of questions for Max, if I could. Mm -hmm. um, the the property up to Winslow's Mills. That doesn't have to go in front of the planning board. And no. why is that? That's a new business. It doesn't fall under the. It doesn't fall under Article Six for going to the planning board. It doesn't fall under any of that criteria. And the other question I have for you: So Stan was able to make this. This obviously he made the decision to let them stop that process. He signed a building permit okay. for interior walls. Yeah. So, does anybody know how far that is to the church from the property line? Like the exact setback? Right. Um, For that type of business? I, I can measure it when I leave the meeting hall today. But it doesn't matter. It's already approved, right? I mean, I'm just asking if it was done before you approved oh, the process, to approved the application. So, the mm. cultivation is something that is protected by the state. What's that? The cultivation for a registered caregiver is protected by the state. It doesn't have to go to the planning board until that type of rule or regulation is made. Unless. But isn't this our town? I mean, don't we have the right to say where they can put a business like that in? If, uh, looking at the land use ordinance, there's nothing I could really point to and say that should go to the planning board. Any other questions? Thanks. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Board of Assessors. 
Um, the next is an executive session on Philbrook. We have Philbrook yeah. and assessors. Do I'm sorry? Do you have yeah. Philbrook or just assessors? Both. Yeah. Both. <coughs> we have Philbrook. Yeah, we've got three mm -hmm. of them. I'll take a motion to go into executive session. So yeah. Yeah. Second. All in favor? Uh, I'm going to use the facilities real quick. <laughs> 